All right, so my uh, uh, capstone uh, research project is on tab licensing, and I was uh, charged with focusing on um, uh, licensing through the prism of public health and public safety. And I also covered general welfare as well. Uh, by pets, I, uh, I mean primarily dogs and cats, is what I focus on. Domestic animals. Um, I looked at several different cities, um, which I will discuss shortly. Um, so I had to discuss the, the matter with the uh, committee head of uh, the Manhattan Department of Parks and Recreation, and um, they're in charge of uh, carrying out the pets licensing order policy uh, for the city council, um, and they. Uh, the pet shelter is to protect the public, handle safety issues, uh, if there's any issues in law enforcement, uh, as far as like holding animals that are at large, uh, they do that. Um, and they, have, they also hold pets uh, that uh, not uh, not tagged. And if owners want to come we uh, group that then from uh, the animal shelter after paying a small fee. Uh, the city of Manhattan is a uh, prevent an issue because uh, they want to make it uh, address the issue of make it more uh, clear to owners, uh, particularly with how the pet licensing is done, but also how different cities are licensing their pets. Um, and I'm just trying to case studies in several different um, cities. Uh, with this, uh, this focus, uh, we begin with the city ordinance as it is right now. It's been in um, 5068. And it's actually have two documents from the agency. They amended it in uh, 2002 um, to make it more clear when the uh, Explain the expiration date of the back uh, of the previous vaccine expired at different dates. Uh, this current policy is that it can't, the uh, pet license can't be issued past the date uh, within the or past the month that the previous vaccination expired. In. And so, to uh, they, this is, uh, I'll send you out uh, an example of what they do to try to explain that process. To pet owners, it's a little bit confusing because the dates aren't necessarily the same. So uh, they want to make it clear for um, constituents, pet uh, pet owners, uh, when the expiration date is that they need to pay attention to, when they need to be registered for pets and repurchase of pet license. Uh, also, the policy is it's within uh, 30 days of uh, animal being within sea limits that turns four months. Uh, generally, that's the uh, current policy, um, and they have to provide documentation in order to license the pets, um, and it includes proof of vaccinations for uh, rabies. And it's also a uh, incentive for rearing and spading pets. This is primarily the process of Manhattan's pet licensing. Uh, Start with the owners buying a life, person license, license at the fee, typical of the fee, whether it's a pet is newly persuaded, it's $6 if the pet is unaltered, uh, and it's $12 if the pet is newly uh, persuaded, um, as I said. Um, the city provides the vets with applications, um, going to the pet doctor, and then he shows me what they can provide the envelopes. We mail it back to City Hall. Uh, it includes the uh, once they're vaccinated, proof that they've been vaccinated, so they can mail it along with paying their pet uh, registration fees. Uh, it is a requirement uh, that it's done. Um, and I'll discuss this. Uh, so, the issue is vaccination, like I mentioned, the dates are not aligned perfectly. Uh, I will we'll start now. Other cities have this issue and Spina. Uh, I look at quite a bit at how they handle it. There, uh, the rabies vaccinations expire on the date that license that it can be issued past that date. Um, it's definitely not 
the standard for or the set way that every other city does it. All the cities do it different ways. I think or that would probably be the clearest way to do it, um, policy wise. Uh, for pet for pet owners. Um, because of the confusion it causes. Um, yeah, so I will uh, look at several cities uh, for the study. I ask the question, what is an efficient and effective process to have pets licensed in the city of Manhattan, uh, Kansas? Uh, of you that I research project with introduction of the issue, as I discussed already a little bit. Uh, I'm doing different approaches by uh, several cities. And this was uh, quite encompassing in part uh, speaking to several public public officials, public agencies uh, throughout uh, the state, and I also spoke with one in the state of Missouri, uh, and the city. I'll discuss research design and my findings and recommendations uh, based on uh, the research I've done and data. Uh, it's a public issue, health issue. Uh, dogs bites, they cause human deaths from rabies. They can uh, cause other illnesses such as Lyme disease. And uh, if the owners aren't cleaning up the dog food, it's, it's also a health issue with that as well. Uh, sanitation issue. And as far as safety, uh, dog bites actually you know, they affect uh, health and well being, but they also affect. Uh, people's perception of how they feel about their community. Um, it's estimated 4.5 million people in each year, according to the American Veterinary Medical Association. Um, and there's approximately 914 new dog bite injuries required in emergency business uh, every single day. So it's a very big uh, public safety issue for public administrators to address. Um, I also address um, the wellness or well-being of pets. Um, this is actually quite comprehensive, but this is a list of all the uh, recommended rabies um, and other shots that for other illnesses dogs get. Um, so this uh, this licensing actually it, it serves pets uh, quite as, as well as much of, uh, as well as it does for the community. Large. Um, in the Humane Society, looking at social statistics, plus they said the average community spends about eight dollars per capita, or it's about twelve point five uh, animals per one thousand people. So it's uh, it's quite expensive. Um, I'll look at what other cities have done as well as trying to address the cost, the enormous cost in some cases of. Um, how to handle that as an issue. Uh, pet owners, uh, they're, um, they should be responsible, and that's uh, because of the obvious negative externalities that the owner of the pet has to your neighbors and others that live with your community. Uh, so, pet licensing uh, helps administrative agencies, the fees collected. And it helps identify animals, animals, strays, uh, animals at large, uh, whether for recovery purposes or to determine responsibility for people being hurt by uh, animal attacks. Um, and of course, people lose their pets, they want to get their pets back in time of matter. That is the most responsible thing to do. Uh, I've also spoken to the uh, animal shelter. And these are some of the statistics that we have for the year 2006 to 2011. And Devala provided this information. He's the uh, director of the animal uh, shelter. Um, and I don't really see, uh, there's not really any apparent trend in the amount of bites over time, whether increasing or decreasing. Uh, however, uh, it doesn't seem like uh, compliance with the policy is. Uh, but definitely the compliance with policy is an important public issue. Um, this is a graph that's provided by the agency. Um, so T. Russell Ryan Tanks. And you can see that most of the bikes is, is 
most of them tend to be you know, either minor or they can be major uh, by an outcome prior medical profession. Uh, However, it should be uh, safe to assume that it's all the animal bites that are reported. Uh, often the uh, reports are made to the police and again they contact the uh, state to the handle the uh, dog bites. Uh, to assess the uh, effectiveness of the current policy, as well as is comparable to other municipalities, I looked at the rate of pets licensed uh, out of the total pot pet populations. I'll explain how I estimated that and calculated it. Um, it um, I also looked at the rate of revenue out of the total uh, pet population to determine uh, if is if the city's uh, ordinance is actually uh, doing what it needs to do and is actually meeting its criteria for collecting the amount of data that's uh, necessary to you know, keep the policy going, ordinance in place, or if it needs to be reviewed, reviewed and revised. Uh, so, my research is I look at the literature, uh, policy is currently in place. Uh, I interviewed um, several public officials, some referred to the others, of course, but uh, one of the following was Animal Shelter. Um, uh, I also actually contacted two individuals from Animal Shelter, uh, as well as uh, individuals from four other uh, municipalities. Uh, and this is how I calculated the uh, net ownership calculator. I used the United States Census Bureau information. And it took me to um, this website, and I put in the uh, population or uh, community. It gives me the uh, I get the amount of uh, dogs and cats. I add these amounts up, and I use that for pet population. And from that, I can take the amount of pets in a license and determine um, how effective the policy is. Um, that's, the, that's the process I use to determine how effective every city was doing with that license. Um, uh, it's the city that I chose for Manhattan, Salina, so Kansas City. Um, I also wanted to use Lenexa. However, um, uh, and, and I also contacted the Shawnee. So the reason I selected Salina and Manhattan is because their populations are relatively about the same. Um, I also did uh, make the city selection choices based on proximity. Uh, Salina is to the west of Manhattan, and so we're center of Kansas City. Just to get a better idea of the different uh, areas, how they handle the pet policy. Uh, I also contacted, uh, about the outsourcing issue, I uh, contacted uh, I attempted to contact the next at first, but they didn't comply with the public records request that I made. Um, so I found it in uh, Kansas City. I used it in, in lieu of um, the next um, They can outsource to a patent, uh, private company that handles uh, their pet licensing process, and um, I just find that quite interesting. I also contacted uh, Shawnee. And uh, their mayor referred me to uh, their city clerk. And Shawnee actually was an interesting approach. Uh, their policy in place, and they actually ended it until that license in 2010. Um, it cost them about 15 grand a year. And they found that there was, um, they were asked by the city council whether um, they could do pet licensing or could they do tagging rabies vaccinations without having pet licensing required by the city. And they determined that that was not something that affected other cities that did get rid of pet licensing. So I just found it interesting that they just overall, um, they require rabies shots, but they do not require you to have city, they have to have tags, that's one information, but they do not require a city pet licensing uh, registration. However, they do maintain their database in 2010 based on a large system. So they have that. So I asked for 
Um, this is information from the Manhattan's uh, Head License and Revenue Collected. Um, you can see that it's not uh, really trending one way or another. Um, I was informed around when, um, by the agency, that when deployments occur, that there is a little bit of an increase in the pandemic, uh, also with graduation. So, um, that's interesting, but I didn't, um, I didn't actually focus too much on that. But that would, it would be interesting to look at how that might, um, how that might play into it. If I were to look at cities uh, that either have military base or university and see how their efficiency rates are in comparison. Um, overall, uh, Manhattan uh, covered around the nine and a half percent, where the percent has slices. Based on the population of the human pet, human population for cities, uh, determining what the pet population is for the cities, and then adding the pets, the number of dogs and cats together. I then took the uh, amount of pets that were licensed uh, according to, uh, to the agency, uh, divided it by the pet population, get the percentile. Uh, and I did this for all cities except. Uh, yeah, I did that for all cities from the U.S. Census. Uh, yes. um, so for benchmarking, uh, this is an interesting, interesting slide. I look at each of the cities that I looked at, the way they approached it, uh, Kansas City and uh, so like the next city, as I mentioned before, they outsource the pet licensing process to uh, companies, uh, private companies called pet data. Um, Kansas City charged about ten dollars, Mexico charged about twenty-two dollars, and it's about a, it's a dollar ninety-five um, at, uh, administration fee. Uh, Manhattan had a twelve-dollar fee. Um, it has not publicly um, handled. So does the uh, city of Salina. It's an animal shelter. Um, primarily, I most of the rate of compliance for Salina is significant. Or it's, Quite a bit larger than that happens. Um, I noticed um, that was for all years uh, reporting. Um, and so I look at um, different aspects of slides policy that could either be emulated or a lot of lines and how it applies here. Dan Shawnee just banned this uh, altogether. So that's another approach. So we have license guys. So, so this is a company Petia. Um, started in '94, and they uh, process pet licensing for about six million pets uh, for about sixty cities. Um, and they mainly they do it for public agencies, bottles, um, so we can reduce. To their, their website. Mm -hmm. It's the only company that um, it actually the only American company that only exists for the purpose of that licensing. I've noticed it's going to be quite a trend going in that direction. Um, so this is um, Salina. They're about licensing and revenue collected. Notice that the uh, revenues uh, so they uh, much larger than the amount of revenue collected in uh, However, I would uh, not, the compliance is 13 and a half, 13 and a quarter percent, or 9 and a half percent in average, give or take. Uh, but their, their fees are higher. Uh, whereas the uh, Manhattan charge is about $6 for an alternate for animals, it's uh, $8 in supply for an alternate animal. So, um, it's understandable why their revenue is higher just because their rate is a little bit higher. Um, however, the rate the, uh, and the compliance never gets much higher than the 13 and a half percent, basically. So, for Kansas City, which uh, outsourced this pet policy, uh, they have a much larger human population and therefore. A much larger um, dog cat population, cat population. Uh, their their rate of 
uh, any pets or devices or appliances in ordinance is actually not this high. That's why I um, So it doesn't, it doesn't show that, at least this, thing from this data does not show that outsourcing pet licensing uh, based on my future product. It's any better than having the public agency handle the data is support uh, their adapting of this uh, to one or the other because it's uh, outsourced or because of public agency has this responsibility. Um, so my recommendations for uh, the Kansas Department of Arts and Recreation is to follow uh, the example closer set by the city of Salina and uh, not extend license expiration dates past the vaccination expiration dates. Uh, again, I can set for the same month, but not the same date. I would change it to the same date, which is my recommendation. Because um, you guys read the handout, it's clear for pet owners. Also, um, my other suggestion, my other recommendation is that the, uh, the department uh, chronicalizes this uh, like that licensing process so that it is more clear to pet owners what the policy is, why, why it's the way it is, and it's a clear process and steps involved. Um, also, with the city of uh, Slime, I noticed they have quite a, a lot of interesting uh, parts of their um, pet licensing policy, one of which is uh, inserting uh, like a microchip which gives the pet a uh, lifetime registration for their pet license. Um, however, they still have to get the rabies uh, vaccination every year. Um, I thought that was pretty interesting. They've also, um, they also do whatever they can to try to get vaccination records from the vets. Um, so I thought that was um, that type of proactivity and help with compliance as well. Um, and I don't think I don't see a reason why the, uh, the fee couldn't be raised based on the statistics because the app has lowest level of compliance, six dollars. So I don't, I don't think this data doesn't show a higher, it doesn't show an increasing amount of compliance with the licensing ordinance uh, based on charging uh, more for that. So I think clarity is something. Um, actually, quite a bit of the research was brought here. Um, you know, we did determine great information. Okay. All right. All right. Oops. I didn't mean to say. Do you have any questions? Yes. Okay. At the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned that there was a discount for. Fixed yes. Does that happen in Manhattan, or yes? Is the only thing you mentioned was the twelve pound. Yes, an altered or un uh, neutered uh, pet. It's uh, six dollars for a one year uh, license, and twelve dollars uh, for uh, six dollars for a pet. That's, it is neutered. Uh, twelve dollars for a pet that's not. And it, it's, it's pretty consistent across the board with the cities. They all discount the ones that have that licensing and provide the information. They all discount usually about half uh, based on the debt was um, uh, altered now. Uh, um, but I, I did notice that when pets were um, stayed in there, they were more. Did you use an average? Of all the costs when you were estimating the revenues, or was the revenue number straight from the city? Which, the question asked, how did you get to the revenue number? Did you use an average of the scale of costs to do the revenue number, or did the revenue number come directly from the city? I picked the, uh, the revenue cost specifically from the city. Uh, they're all posted on their websites, respectively. Um, I noticed that there was a tendency for pet owners to license their pets for longer periods of time uh, after uh, spading a new or another pet because uh, it makes sense if the, if the animal isn't a new pet, they usually, it's more likely that they'll pay for one year. But after they are a new or spading, 
Uh, so it's more likely it's uh, more likely to pay for, for the higher profit than to pay for a longer period of time than it would if it was an impact wasn't. So so not only is it incentive for them for pet population control, but it also uh, they're more likely to be able to pets for longer periods of time as well. So yeah. Is there a penalty for not having your pet or yeah, that there is a penalty for when you uh, recollect your pet from the shelters. However, I did focus on all the shelters for all the cities for uh, recovery of pets. Uh, I was trying to focus on the pet licensing aspect of it. So I, I would, uh, I would recommend that they that they do uh, increase the uh, cost for recovering pets. Uh, because it disincentivizes not uh, registering your pet once it's uh, held by the animal shelter. So it makes more sense. But that's what you think, right? Right. You can get that back. Like, that's true. That's a conjecture. But we're only talking about pets whose owners are stupid enough to let them get away. <laughs> right. You're only charged if you're yeah, yeah. Pet gets out. Right. There's no one no one in this house is asking for pets or registered. So is yeah. there is there any way that they could perhaps uh, Dr. I have a dog and I'm not sure how this whole thing works. I'll just play when my wife takes care of it or something. Are we paying yearly to license, Rudy? There's an option for one, two, and three years. Uh, okay. So, couldn't they follow up on the people who don't come back? Whatever. There's lots of money. So, less than 10% of the pets who should be licensed are licensed? Right. In that, yes. Okay. So, any idea on why there's the discrepancy between what's happening in Manhattan and what's happening in Salina? It's only 13% there. I mean, there's a it's not. I can do the arithmetic, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the agency mentioned that. Like, 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 the military plan, like, 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 from Fort Riley, that the amount of pets and damages goes up. Okay, and students. It's a more transient population, and because of graduation uh, as well. That's why I think that if everybody do this again, I would look at, again, I say with the university, I say with, um, Military phase with both, and then see if that made a difference compared to say like the townships. Yes. All right. Okay. So, my question is, is because I've done this with my pets. If you go to the vet and you license or you get the rabies vaccine, and they give you the envelope and they give you the application, what do you have a recommendation for the city to then turn to? these veterinarian clinics have them collect the fee maybe have a small bit of the fee go to the vet for dealing with the paperwork and sending off that letter because sometimes those letters come home and there's an additional check you're supposed to send off and that's why it never gets done I like a scam <laughs> well i don't know i would i didn't look at that uh, particularly uh, so i would have had a recommendation i was going to say I'm that's not a really too interesting much. question because the, the number of people who are licensed, or not licensed, but have their pets vaccinated when you're bringing up your little table and it shows how many people are compliant versus non-compliant. Right. So how many people are actually complying with getting the rabies vaccines but then not sending off the application for the pet license? Mm -hmm. Well, they can't. Uh, the, the rabies vaccination, uh, that's interesting. Um, I didn't look at that. Because you can get the rabies vaccine without the license, but you can't get the license without the vaccine. Because so. they don't, yeah, the vets don't keep track. They keep track of the, just the ready, you know, the vaccinated pet, but they don't uh, tell the city, you know, it's up to the pet owner to send in the, uh, the vaccination and the registration information for pet license. So that's interesting. That would be a good question to look at. No, no, if you were to say something, my, my question is directed for this kind of question. I'm curious, as you interact with the number of communities, we talk about the number of pets in the community. There's a big difference between dogs and cats. People have a tendency to license dogs in 
very seldom do they license cats. I think at the same time, their information would be interesting what you just did. I do dog specific. And what those numbers would have changed the that You have Salina broken down by dogs and cats, right? Yeah, I have it in my final report. I have it uh, in all of our accounts and dogs and cats. Uh, and and uh, uh, assisted animals or animals that uh, help uh, with uh, the blind, the blind, or uh, therapy sure. animals, service animals. Yeah. We said in the early also the feral cat, which we're going to stick up to the number of feral animals. <coughs> so we're seeing that right now, even if it isn't slide, it will help us to also see that distinction between dogs and cats. Right, I could, I could adjust the ACMA calculator and just figure out the hogs and take that out the total. Um, you know, it's very easy. You can uh, make a paragraph. Make a paragraph. Mm -hmm. That's not great. I'm curious about this pet data thing. What do they do? They, uh, do they run the shelters also? What was that? Do they run the shelters also? No, no, the uh, no, they don't run the shelters. They just license pets. Okay, so the Lenexa in Kansas City, do they run a system of shelters also? I mean, do the cities run those? Cities still run the shelters. Okay, it's just the licensing thing. Right. It's just they, they don't even uh, enforce. They just uh, license the pets, right. and then they kind of collect the data from that. Right. Uh, the website actually requires that. They That's fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.